Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Preeti Sodi, and I'm the Director of Community Engagement with the High Line. Today, we are here to talk about the High Line Moynihan Train Hall Connector with a focus on the design of the project. We will be joined by my colleagues at the High Line, as well as our project partners, Empire State Development and Brookfield Properties. Speaking with you today will be Mauricio Garcia, Chief Program and Engagement Officer at the High Line, and members of the Moynihan Connector Design Team. Lisa Switzkin from James Corner Field Operations, who is also, who is also in the original de design team for the High Line and has been working with us for over 20 years. James Corner Field Operations also worked on the public plaza at Manhattan West. She'll be joined by Kim Van Holsbeek from SOM. SOM is the design firm responsible for the Manhattan West development. Before we get started, I wanted to talk about some logistics for today's meeting. We will be using a Zoom webinar format. Please enter any questions or comments you have in the chat, and we will be organizing them to be answered at the end of the presentation. We will answer as many design-related questions as possible during this session. Questions related to other topics will be captured and shared with the project partners. In the coming weeks, we'll publish an FAQ on our website to address commonly raised questions. Today's meeting will have closed captioning enabled. To enable closed captioning, on the bottom menu of the Zoom screen, click closed captioning icon. It's a CC. Then select show subtitle to enable subtitles. This meeting will be recorded and uploaded to the Highline website in the coming days. And now I'm gonna to pass to Mauricio Garcia. Thanks Preeti and welcome again everyone to the Highline Moynihan Connector Community Design Briefing. I'm Mauricio Garcia, the Chief Program and Engagement Officer at the Highline. I'd like to say before we kick off a few special thanks uh, first and foremost, thanks to Governor Hochul for her support on this project, to our project partners, Brookfield Par Properties, Empire State Development, and to our design team, as uh, Preeti mentioned, James Corner Fuel Operations and SOM. Thanks, a big shout out and thanks to our local elected officials who have been so critical to the success of the High Line and to this project. That includes Deputy Mayor Vicki Bean and the New York City Parks Department, New York City Council Speaker Corey Johnson, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, New York State Assembly members Richard Gottfried, Deborah Glick, New York State Senate uh, State Senators Brad Hoylman and Robert Jackson, U.S. Representative Gerald Nadler, and last but not least, U.S. Senators Charles Schumer and Kirsten Gillibrand. Thanks also to all the residents, small businesses, community organizations, and more who we've spoken to throughout this project and who we will continue to speak with along the way. And of course, thanks to all the Highline staff, our board and our generous donors for their continued support um, along the way. Also, many of you may be familiar with our longtime executive director and Highline co-founder, Robbie Hammond. He was very, very excited about tonight's event, but unfortunately he was not able to join us. He's actually on duty representing the Highline at a special event with the governor. Um, so he sends his uh, regards and his gratitude for everyone who's joined. So we're here tonight to look toward the future of the West Side. But before we do, I want to provide some important background. To most, the High Line is a park that was built on a historic elevated rail line. But the High Line was always meant to be more than just a park. We're devoted to reimagining public space to create connected, healthy neighborhoods and cities. And a little known fact is that nearly all of our budget comes from donations from people like you, so thank you. But before we dive into the discussion of the new construction that is the topic of today's meeting, we think it's important to look back at history to understand how the West Side and how the High Line developed into what they are today. From the time, from the, time the High Line was originally built in the 1930s, it offered connectivity as a way of strengthening New York City. For over three decades, the High Line served to transport millions of tons of meat, dairy, produce to nearby factories and warehouses. In fact, the High Line served so much of the city's fresh food that it was nicknamed the Lifeline of New York. 
But starting in 1980, the High Line was left unused until our two co-founders joined forces to advocate for the High Line's preservation and transformation into a public amenity. This included engaging an array of local residents and small businesses around the possibility of converting this piece of abandoned infrastructure into a new public open space. That's when the Friends of the Highline was born. Since our founding, Friends of the Highline has been committed to engaging and learning from local residents, neighbors, and other stakeholders. This included hosting an ideas comp competition early on when the park didn't, wasn't, didn't exist, where we made a call for ideas for ways the then new unused Highline might be used. We received ideas from over 700 individuals and teams, including ideas such as converting the High Line into a lap pool, into a roller coaster, and other more practical uses. Fast forwarding to today, the High Line is a park that connects three neighborhoods along Manhattan's west side, the Meatpacking District, Chelsea, and Hudson Yards. And in many ways, the High Line's former nickname, Lifeline of New York, is quite fitting is our vision as an organization and as a park is to become a civic connector. And what I mean by that is linking people to the social, environmental, cultural, and economic opportunities on and off the high line, just stressing on and off the high line and prioritizing those who have not benefited from these resources in the past. So that leads us to tonight's topic, the high line connectors. Originally designed for industrial reuse and later on vehicles, we now wanna look at the west side in terms of people. How can people move from one end of the High Line at 30th Street to other neighborhoods, green spaces like Hudson River Park, which is amazing, and subways and trains. For those of you who live or frequent this part of Manhattan's west side, and you can see it right here on the screen, you're likely familiar with the large multi-block developments that have interrupted, interrupted multiple key intersections. Simply put, it's just not easy or safe at times to get from Midtown to the far west side. With large trucks moving down, that large trucks moving down 9th Avenue, cars headed to Lincoln Tunnel and more. It's a challenge for people to move from Penn Station over to the west side, and really it's now it's a time to address this. Most of us know that the marks of a successful modern city are open, accessible, and inclusive public spaces that help improve accessibility, safety, physical and mental health. Now, ever since the early days of the High Line, we've considered the challenges to pedestrian mobility throughout this part of the neighborhood and assessed opportunities for improvement. And we have long championed that the idea of connecting the west side of Manhattan with new elevated pathways. But it's important to point out that we also stand on the shoulders of many people who've been thinking about this for many, many years. We recognize and appreciate that throughout the years, a number of local elected officials and many community groups in the neighborhood have conducted formal studies and research to understand ways to improve the mobility in this part of the neighborhood. And with that in mind, uh, in January of earlier this year, the state of New York announced a plan to build two physical connectors on Manhattan's west side. And you can see them here in the screen. One of those connectors um, would connect the High Line to the new Moynihan train hall by way of Manhattan West, the mixed use development um, that's adjacent to Moynihan Train Hall. And then another connector that would eventually connect the High Line to Hudson River Park by way of the Javits Center. And then last month, Governor Kathy Hochul unveiled designs for the first project, the High Line, High Line Moynihan Connector. And tonight we're excited to preview the design of this project with you. This project, as you see here through the schedule, formally commenced in February and March with our first conversations with stakeholders. We expect construction to commence in late November of this year and with an expected completion by April of 2023. And since the start of this project, the Highline team and our project partners have spoken to a number of stakeholders on the West Side, from our local elected officials, community board four, community-based organizations, advocacy groups, tenant associations, black associations, small businesses, and many more. And we plan to continue meeting with these stakeholders to share more updates and gather more input. So the High Line truly is the spine of the West Side, allowing residents and visitors to move between three neighborhoods and 22 city blocks without crossing a single street. 
Projects like the Highline Moynihan Connector help highlight the importance of parks in our cities and the ability for existing parks, such as the Highline, to continuously reinvent themselves to serve a greater purpose for transportation, for health and wellness, for arts and culture, and a whole lot more. The Highline Connector will serve as a new safe link to transit facilities, parks, residential neighborhoods, business center, and cultural institutions. And with that, I'd like to hand things over to the, to the project design team of Lisa Switkin and Kim Van Hosbeck to walk you through the design of the Highline Moynihan Connector. Thank you. Great. Uh, great to be here and excited to show you and walk you through what uh, we came up for, for the Highline Morning and Connector. Next. As Mauricio explained, this is really about creating connections and pedestrian experiences uh, that allowed us to connect the High Line spur specifically with the morning and train hall and continue to add to the transformation of the West Side. The, transfer, the connection will really provide a seamless connectivity from the newly opened morning and train hall through Manhattan West development with its great public realm and create the key connection to the spur and the high line, uh, allowing for seamless uh, pedestrian connectivities between both neighborhood areas. Next. The design we're proposing is really informed by looking at the challenges and the opportunities hands in the urban fabric. Along 30th Street, we have a very large urban street presence of a, a typical 30th Street plus the Dyer Avenue approach uh, into Lincoln Tunnel. Uh, facing on the south with a low historical building, but at great, really challenged by lots of vehicular uh, constraints. Next. Dyer Avenue uh, is a very narrow connector, 100% defined by the incoming traffic and outgoing traffic into the Lincoln Tunnel and confined by two development sites adjacent to it, right at the property line. Next. The sites is very complex do existing utilities, add great connections, uh, where we could land structure to hold up the connections uh, on top of the urban opportunities and constraints I just showed you before. Next. On top of that, the connector is really located, majority of it on a lot one Port Authority site and crosses over New York City property along 31st Street and 33rd Street to connect to, on the south side, the High Line Spur and the north side, the Brookfield Manhattan West Public Realm. Next. Those conditions are also, and the, and the design is also informed obviously by the urban context that defines the solar approach and the solar access on the site where 30th Street through its broad urban presence and its lower building on the south had a good amount of solar presence and dire wedged between two existing and potential developments, much less. Next. Hi everybody, it's also great to be here. I'm Lisa with Field Operations. And thanks, Kim. I think, you know, the existing conditions were so much a uh, part of how the design kind of came to be. So we thought it was important to understand them, even though it's still, you know, pretty high level. But really, the way that we started to think about the design was as an episodic journey, very similar to the Highline itself in many ways. The designs really envision this way. You're moving from very highly different urban contexts, but it's really compressed. It's in a super short amount of time. And so you get this cross section, you know, through West Manhattan, from the bustle of Moynihan Station, through the contemporary urban path, at Manhattan West into the kind of urban room of the spur and then entering into the more sort of typical verdant landscape and neighborhood of the upper high line. And all of this happens in a really short period of time, which is both, you know, it can be both a challenge, but it's also a really incredible opportunity. Next. So from the beginning, you know, there was really a shared vision that the design of the connector should be related to the High Line, but it should not be a literal extension or copy of the High Line. You know, the High Line, it was an existing structure. This is new construction, and it's a really different urban context. Some of those sections that, 
you know, Kim was sharing before, you know, it's not like the Highline where you have a very intimate relationship with the neighborhood and the buildings adjacent to it. Here along 30th, there's actually a very wide space between the Morgan Post Office and, you know, the future development to the north and some of the existing buildings and development to the north. So it's, it's quite different. And, you know, the design is really comprised of two different bridges. So there's the Dyer section, and this is conceived um, as a timber bridge. Each bridge sort of has its own architectural and structural expression, as well as a different experience as you move through it. There are, of course, unifying elements that weave all these together, um, as well as contextual elements that help to provide orientation and a sense of place. So these are things, for example, the existing smokestack that some of you may be familiar with, as well as, of course, the Morgan Post Office and even the Highline Art Plinth now, which is such an icon and orientation device. So the Dyer Timber Bridge is really conceived as an immersive timber experience, and, and Kim will go into more detail about that. And then the 30th Street Woodland Bridge is envisioned as an immersive landscape experience. So as Kim mentioned right before, you know, this is an area where we actually do get sunlight um, and the bridge design actually supports, um, you know, really mature plantings, et cetera. And then there's a very lightweight connection to the existing High Line at the spur. Next. So here you see the illustrative plan. Um, the Dyer section is about 260 feet and it really recalls sort of New York State's historic war and trust bridges, but it has a contemporary expression, which Kim will talk about in more detail. And then the Woodland Bridge is the piece along 30th Street and this is about 365 feet. And again, this is the immersive landscape really designed to support significant tree planting. You can see that the path along 30th Street is actually like a diagonal slice. And this really provides both direct pedestrian flow, but it also takes advantage of those key views and contextual elements. So, you know, you actually can see the plinth when you're at the edge of it. Um, and you can see the timber bridge if you're coming from the opposite direction from the spur. So we're gonna go into a little bit more detail of each of the different um, bridges, the spur connection, the woodland bridge, as well as the, the timber bridge. Next. So one of the key things with the 30th Street Bridge is that here we had the opportunity to actually create a structure that could support significant planting. So it's much deeper soil than the existing High Line. The 30th Street Bridge really can support lush, mature trees and plantings with um, native species that are inspired by New York State forests. And the deepest soil sections are about four to five feet. And this really ensures the health and the longevity of the vegetation. It's a very harsh and exposed urban environment. You get sort of as a bridge structure, freeze and thaw above and below. There's a lot of wind, um, et cetera. And the woodland really creates this unique, vibrant and planted experience that extends not only the ecological corridor of the Highline, but it also helps to really insulate noise and wind and it provides shade. And it also has a really strong green presence from the street. Next. So with the 30th Street Bridge, there was also this idea that you know, the landscape is actually tied to the structural expression. So the planting is tall and sort of lush where there is soil. Um, and then the structure actually tapers where the walkway is. And the planting also shifts, you can see in the bottom elevation from high to low in one direction and high to low in the other direction. So you sort of have a very high kind of strong presence of green on the ends and more of a low point um, in the middle, right where the smokestack is. And this sort of allows you to have that straight diagonal, which allows you to have clear flow and movement. But as you walk along it, your experience changes because sometimes the planting is to your left, sometimes you're surrounded by planting and immersed in it on both sides, and sometimes it's to your right. So the experience is very different and your glimpses of the context around you also shifts and changes. Next. And the planting design is also inspired by Eastern deciduous forests. Um, it's really designed as forest layers as a forest would sort of um, actually be structured. And so this includes a canopy layer, a mid-story tree layer, a shrub layer, and an understory layer. And this layered approach is really designed for year-round interests. So the mid-story layer sort of has all the flowering trees in the spring. There's all sorts of verdant greens in the summer. 
there's vibrant fall foliage and blooms, of course, in the autumn. And then there's really strong tree forms and evergreens um, with even those like red berries and things like this in the winter. And all of the tree species are really, they're similar to other places on the high line. They're very similar to the spur planting that are in the tilted uh, weathered steel planters, as well as the Gansevoort woodland and the flyover and the Chelsea thicket. And of course the species were really, not only were they based on these native species, but at the same time, you know, there was quite a limited selection palette because this had to be based on sun exposure, wind tolerance, tolerance of urban conditions, um, et cetera. So we can go into different species, but the trees are a mix of sugar maple, birch, hornbeam, hackberry, et cetera. You have mid-story of service buds and red buds and dogwoods and junipers. And then there's all of these other shrub layers and understory layers. Next. So that's the 30th Street Bridge. And then there is this very light connection at the spur itself. And so this is the existing condition of the spur. Um, you can see the sort of stair that is landing on 30th Street at the Morgan Station Post Office. And you can actually you know, see where the High Line used to connect. The, the tracks that are remaining as part of the spur design used to actually go right into that building. And there's a balcony um, at the end with the seating and the planter which is looking towards Ninth Avenue. Next. So the proposed connection to the Highline Spur um, is happening at the north. And this really represented the lightest touch, both visually and structurally, out of a number of options that we explored. And the northern connection, it limits structural tie-ins to the existing spur. It helps really facilitate movement. Um, and flow by keeping really that circulation to the north instead of going through the spur itself. Um, it also allows that you know, balcony to kind of function as it does today and the rest of the spur to really function as it does today. And at the same time, you also get a really significant threshold or gateway through the historic railing. So you sort of are brought into close contact with the historic railing and you cross through it as a threshold when you enter onto the High Line or when you leave from the High Line, depending on which direction you're going. Next. So here you can sort of see it um, coming together. This, this image is taken from Ninth Avenue looking west. So you're looking towards the spur and towards Magnolia where you kind of see the 30th Street Bridge meeting the Dyer uh, Timber Bridge. And Kim is gonna go into more detail on the Dyer Timber Bridge. And on this image, oh, go back one, sorry. This image also shows you how the armature of the structure that's holding up this woodland bridge has a very strong architectural presence uh, expressed in weathered steel and kind of get that rusty uh, look and materiality within the precast uh, container that's really held up there that holds the deep soil. And um, in, as a counterpoint and a supplement to that narrative, the timber bridge connects that very lush green uh, woodland on the eastern part to the north through a timber bridge that connects to the Magnolia Court at Manhattan West and really creating that visual uh, and physical connection between the two uh, landscape defined areas. Next. And so the timber bridge is really floating over Dyer Avenue as it turns north to go into the Lincoln Tunnel and disappear under Manhattan West public space. And as previously mentioned, it's very much defined by the much more narrower uh, urban condition, but also much narrower and, and fewer location of actually creating touchdown points for the structure. Uh, and as a result of that, we really wanted to make the structure that was a long span uh, uh, structural elements and system to be an immersive and experiential uh, element that we envisioned as a timber bridge, which is a very highly carbon efficient and climate uh, responsive solution to this uh, uh, challenge. Next. The expression of the timber bridge then also related back to elements that we uh, relate to in New York City landscape. Uh, train tracks that go over the rivers, but also even closer by in Chelsea on the riverfront where some of the wood timber trusses were used in uh, along the waterfront. And that expression really 
became the expression of the Warren Truss Timber Bridge over Dyer. Next. Really creating a iconic structural figure that allowed you to walk through and be immersive if in a wood textured into reality that related to the natural landscape materiality on the Woodland Bridge. Next. So bringing those all elements, here's a picture where we're looking northwest of the existing condition. You see 30th Street on the left side of the picture, a larger island where the Woodland Bridge would sit and Dyer Avenue, very much a vehicular driven uh, surrounding or surrounding where we have the spur on the upper left corner and the Magnolia courts in between the two glass uh, buildings at Manhattan West. And the new addition of the High Line Monaghan connector will really transform this area and the pedestrian way of how to connect from one point to the other one. Next. To this combination of two bridges, the Woodland Bridge, Long 30th Street and the Timber Bridge perpendicular to that, traversing north to Manhattan West, from which one you then traverse into the Manhattan's public race, go east and connect into Monaghan train station. Next. I think now we just wanted to take you on a walk, basically walking you um, from the spur as if you were leaving the spur and walking through all the way to Moynihan, because unless you've sort of walked it, it's it's actually a little bit hard to imagine. And for those of you that know the site today, it's actually extremely difficult, of course, to travel as a pedestrian. Um, but what's, once this is complete, it, it does become this public thread that really connects people not only to transit, but it also links up the other public spaces and community assets in the neighborhood. So here we're, we're starting at the spur. That's the, the sort of northern gate, um, the small kind of modest um, opening within the existing historic railing at the spur where you would actually come on to the connector. And this view is, is looking um, on 30th, looking um, to the east. You can maybe just cycle through these, but I think Kim and I will probably both just say a few, a few things about it. Um, so once it's complete, that full um, pathway, you know, extends all the way eastward to Moynihan. So this is if you've now stepped onto the Woodland Bridge, you can see the truss of the, the sort of Dyer Bridge, the Timber Bridge. Um, that's kind of, you know, this, this gateway, this moment where the two bridges connect that's drawing you forward. And, and again, as you, you're moving, correct. stepping as, closer. As you get closer, you suddenly see the bridge and again, it orients your eye towards your, your kind of path and your destination. Uh, even before you visually see the Manhattan West public space, it kind of points you that direct direction and, and announces the next uh, episodical experience. Next. Yeah, and I think even with these images, you can start to see there is a real desire to have like a, a unique, um, you know, robust, but kind of warmer palette in terms of materiality, in terms of both the pathway material, the timber bridge, um, everything else, you know, that, that is really a counterpoint to a lot of the gray asphalt um, in the area. So now you've turned, we're actually switching the other direction, <laughs> but you can see the woodland bridge behind you and now you're actually in the volume of the timber truss. As you can see how this really becomes this kind of almost uh, container you're in as you walk south, uh, south or north along the path that's, you know, you're immersed in a timber environment. Uh, and again, the timber is, is you know, it's a glue lamb wood. Uh, it's uh, likely a cedar, uh, Alaskan cedar uh, that is very durable and, and have longevity and strength and with a low maintenance uh, criteria. Uh, and, and most important, you know, besides the experience is actually the 65% smaller carbon footprint compared to a steel truss. And so this is really a forward looking, uh, innovative approach to uh, creating these new kind of connections and places. Yeah, and as Kim had mentioned, it sort of recalls, you know, the old Warren trusses, but at the same time, it's a very contemporary expression, the heft of it, the sort of detailing of it, um, 
the fact that it is glue lamb. I mean, it's a kind of new take on, on something that still feels like it fits um, in the West Side. So now you're, you've turned around and now you're looking at Manhattan West and Magnolia Court. And actually, of course, Magnolia Court is defined by these magnolia trees um, in the spring. So that's what you're seeing as you're walking through here. And this is really right above the entrance to the Lincoln Tunnel. So that experience, you know, you're now you've, you've passed into, we're looking back again, the Morgan Post Office is in the background, but now you're in Magnolia Court. This would be your view if you had been coming up the other way and entering the, the Timber Trust. Manhattan West, just like the High Line and the Connector are really a, a series of different experiences as a public space, a Magnolia Court. And as you keep walking north, you turn right facing east, you start to seeing the Empire State Building. You go through a two acre uh, plaza with other qualities and, and, and elements in there. Again, lean, uh, lush uh, green zones and plazas, but they bring you down to Ninth Avenue where you then basically arrive at Ninth Avenue where there would be, if you go to the next one, a crossing uh, into uh, Farley Station through which you uh, enter into Moynihan Train Hall. And through that really create a fully ADA accessible connection coming out of Monaghan Train Hall all the way back to 12th Street uh, on the south side of the High Line or in the reverse uh, if one commutes or traverses from uh, the meatpacking there's all the way to Monaghan Station with a single street crossing right here at 9th Avenue in this great Beaux-Arts building that would be repositioned and open soon. Yeah, I mean, I think that's it's one of the most impactful thing, I think, because you're on the bridge structure, but because of the topography of the existing, you know, Ninth Avenue, 8th Avenue, et cetera, the grade's actually sloping down. And so here, you know, you're not going down any stairs or elevators to get right from this moment to the top of that timber bridge. Um, but at the same time, there are elevators and stairs that are part of Manhattan West development, um, as well as on the other side of Hudson Yard. So it's it's highly accessible through those points. And you can also go seamlessly um, walking without going down steps or elevators to get from one point to the other. So I think that that is the, the last slide actually of the walk. Uh, and we're moving into the, the Q&A. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, Kim, and Mauricio. Um, before we move to questions, we're, where we will also be joined by Isabel Castilla, uh, Lisa's colleague at Field Operations. Uh, we have a guest with us who has joined. Uh, we're joined by Highline co-founder and executive director, Robert Hammond. Got it. All right, Hi. Um, I just wanted to say thanks. I'm sorry I wasn't able to be here in the very beginning, um, but just really excited. Uh, is, I've seen this presentation many times and I still love seeing it. Um, and I know some of you maybe saw my news that I'm going to be stepping down, but it's not for five more months. So I uh, look forward to being involved. And even after I step it down, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm never really going to leave the high line. So just wanted to thank you all for joining and um, excited to hear your questions too. Thanks, Robert. Uh, so now we're going to start with some questions that were submitted through the registration uh, for the meeting today, as well as through Zoom. And we're going to be focusing on questions about the design. Um, actually, the first question we have is from Mauricio, which is a non-design question. Uh, Someone has asked, will there be an opportunity to tour the construction site before it's completed, as with as was done with previous Highline sections via Open House New York? Thanks, Preeti. And the answer is yes. We're in talks about developing some of those walks with folks. So stay tuned for more information on how to sign up and how to go about doing that. So yes, we will be doing that. Thank you. Uh, there is a question that came in about seating. Will there be seating along the new sections? Um, and there's a second part to this question, which is about elevators. Will there be elevators for accessibility at main intersections along the new route? Isabel, do you want to respond to that one? 
Um, sure. Um, so in regards to seating, um, we are only offering a very small limited area for seating where the two bridges meet um, to basically highlight and provide a unique moment and experience uh, for visitors. The reason we are limiting sitting in this area is because the bridges are intended to be more of a connector between two larger public spaces that do have ample seating. So when we look at these images where we see the pink, uh, that is Magnolia Court, which is part of a network of um, large amount of open spaces that um, encompass Manhattan West. And these spaces have a wide variety of seating ranging from areas for groups to very intimate areas. And then as we see on the left-hand side of the image, the bridge connects to the spur, the High Line Spur, which is kind of the, um, this Eastern terminus of the High Line that along its entire length, as you all probably are very familiar with, also has very ample seating for groups and for individuals. So what we wanted to do with this project was to create a very strong user experience, a connective experience, but given its limited footprint, really allow that to be a space for movement, uh, connecting to these other two spaces that do have the proper footprint and environment uh, for sitting and congregation. In regards to accessibility, um, the, the two bridges connect on these two spaces, both of which have accessible entry points very nearby. So at Magnolia Court, um, right to the east, uh, we have an elevator and a staircase that will connect to 31st Street. And at the, um, at the High Line, we do have an elevator and a stair that connects at 30th Street. In addition to that, um, Magnolia Court can be accessed from um, 9th Avenue directly at the same level as 9th Avenue. You can walk or um, uh, have a completely accessible um, circulation all the way to the connector. And similarly from the High Line, um, the High Line connects to Hudson Yards at grade as well with an accessible connection. So not only will we have elevators nearby, but also both spaces do meet grade um, at a certain point, creating a very seamless and accessible um, journey throughout. Thanks, Isabel. Uh, we have a question about lighting on the bridges themselves. Uh, what type of lighting will be on the connector bridges? Uh, will it be safe at night? I can answer that question as well. Um, so very similar to the High Line, what we're envisioning for the lighting for this space is that it is well illuminated to provide safety levels. Um, the levels of lighting are, um, are, are ba basically the same levels of lighting that are required for any type of public space in New York City. But similar to the High Line, we are designing it so that the lighting is low. The lighting will illuminate the path. It will allow you to see um, from a distance so it will feel safe but it will not pollute the environment because ultimately we do want um, these bridges to allow you to experience the city, to experience the lights of the city and the energy of the city in the same way as the High Line does. So lighting will uh, wash the path, will make you feel safe, um, but at the same time, you will be able to admire all of the um, city context around you um, throughout the, your journey through the bridges. Thank you. Uh, we have a question about the width of the connector bridges. Um, mm -hmm. Someone's asking, you know, from the renderings, they, it's hard to tell, you know, how wide it is. Um, it, it might appear narrow from the renderings. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. So, so there's two distinct bridges, each comes with their own constraints. So the timber bridge, uh, as you can see in the image on the left, has very few touchdown points because of the the intersection over 30th Street, which is a 60 foot span. Uh, then they have, there's two columns there adjacent to the building and then it bridges over to the south to the Woodland Bridge. So there is a certain limitation on uh, structural capacity and lateral uh, balance. And so we maximize the width there. It's anomaly about 14 feet clear, uh, if I believe, at least I correct me. And so that's ample two-way traffic where you can easily walk with two people next to each other comfortably and cross each other. Uh, with two, two by two. Uh, and so the timber bridge gives that experience. On the woodland bridge overall is about 25 feet, I think in width, with a, a, a good 10 foot clear path along that. And again, that's what tried to balance the uh, immersiveness of the landscape uh, and a clear path. And there we were able to make it wider because we have the ability to do some double row of columns that then allows us to do that big immersive landscape above. 
Yeah, and I mean, just to add to that, Isabel's point earlier about not having lots of areas for people to stop and congregate. I mean, that was also part of this design in order to facilitate flow and movement, um, especially in this area, but at the same time, you know, also create an experience. Um, so it is, it, both of them are more than the sort of existing highline, you know, typical path width, um, which we did think was important. And especially the dire section is considerably more. Thanks. Uh, I have a couple of questions for Mauricio. Um, there were a couple of questions about when the connector bridges will be open in terms of their operating times. Um, can you talk about that? And then someone had just asked for you to, if you could quickly just summarize the construction timeline again. Sure, and maybe um, if, if um, Harish, if you could put the timeline back up just so that I can refer to it. Um, Reminder that the, the timeline that the construction is set to commence in late November of this year. I, think I meant operating hours, not timeline time. That's what I thought, right? There were two questions. Oh, one sorry. Was okay. Operating hours <laughs> and one was that time. I, I packaged together Mauricio's questions. <laughs> so, in terms of the first one, the, the construction is set to commence later this year, uh, at the end of this year, as this as the schedule shows, and then completion, substantial completion. Uh, should be done by April of 2023. In terms of the operations and such, we don't have information on that yet. Um, and so we will be sharing more information on how we operate. Um, but given the relationship with the historical High Line, um, that will be taken into consideration. Did I, did I get all the questions, Preeti? Yes, yes okay. you did. Great. Thank you. Um, we had a question about the surface itself on the connector bridges and someone had a question about snow and rain, you know, if it would be slippery. Can you talk a little bit more about that, please, the, the surface of the bridges? Isabel, you want to talk about the walkway material? Sure. Um, so the walkway, as we can see here on these images, is intended to be a warm metal that will complement uh, some of the, the planting. And as Lisa mentioned, bring some warmth to the space considering the enormous amount of roadway we have nearby. Um, we're currently envisioning this walkway to be made out of um, Corten steel, which is the same kind of orange uh, material or steel that you see on the Highline Spur on some of the walls, as well as some of the other Highline planters. To make it um, sleep resistant and to be able to walk on it during any kind of weather condition, whether it's snow, ice, or rain, this material will be perforated um, and what we call dimpled, which is basically, um, it's going to have a series of extrusions that are going to make it into a very rough surface to walk on while still being ADA accessible and comfortable to those with high heels. And this is <clears throat> basically something very similar to what we can see on, um, on exterior staircases, for example, or even on, on some metal um, grates that we see on sidewalks are metals that have a lot of friction on them, a lot of texture, so that we can make sure that they are, um, they are a good walking surface under any type of weather condition, as well as for anybody with different um, walking abilities, as well as high heels. Thanks, Isabel. Um, we have a question about uh, construction. Uh, will the wooden bridge be brought in as one piece, like the bridge recently installed over the West Side Highway? Uh, I think that's going to be a logistical question. So the, the contractor is going to have a big influence. I, I probably doubt it's going to be my guess. It's not in one piece, but the intent is it's probably more sectional but some manufacturing in the factory, some on site, but that's uh, still under progress. It would be a very long single install. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for Lisa, which is a very specific question um, from one of our volunteers. Um, will the soil be the same composite soil used on the High Line itself? Yeah, I can start that and Isabel can probably go into deeper deeper sort of detail. I mean, we are actually using the same soil scientists who worked on the High Line, so they're very familiar with all the soils. Um, and, you know, it is an engineered soil specification due to the existing conditions, but we also, you know, have much more soil than we do on the High Line. So, you know, it is, it is slightly, um, it's a 
better environment for to have these kind of large trees that we're proposing here. Because well, I don't know if there's any like specific details in the actual, you know, ratio of the, the soil composition that's worth mentioning. Sure. I mean, the, the soil, as you mentioned, Lisa, it's, it's exactly the same as the High Line. We just have more of it. Um, but what we're doing to take advantage of the, the additional space that we have is that we're also adding insulation to the plantings, um, to the planting beds, in addition to the soil. What this will do is it will make sure that the trees don't get too hot in the summer and don't get too frozen in the winter, understanding that this is a bridge that just is not at grade and does not have as much um, thermal um, protection as other areas. So we're taking advantage of this additional space to do that. We're also, um, in addition to the soil, we're adding a stronger drainage layer to make sure um, that the space retains water when it needs it, but also is able to drain it properly so that the trees do grow healthy and large. Great. Um, someone has, thank you. Uh, someone has a question about where the woodland bridge um, is connecting to the spur. Uh, they ask, why not connect the woodland bridge at the spur's glass railing instead of cutting the steel railings? Maybe you can talk a little bit about the positioning. Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. And in fact, our initial studies did look at exactly that um, in sort of back and forth with SHPO, which is the State Historic Preservation Office, as well as you know, looking at a bunch of other things. It was actually, even though it might seem like you're not, of course, not cutting the historic railing in order to actually cantilever the structure at that location, you would have had to basically tie in directly to the spur. And this connection allows you to actually cantilever the structure from the new construction of the 30th bridge. So it's a, it is a much lighter touch on the High Line itself. And we are limiting that cut um, in the railing, you know, as much as possible. And we're hoping to actually find a new use for that, that railing as well. If others want to add anything to that, feel free. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we also have a question about safety and railings on the timber bridge. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Kim or Isabel, do you guys want to talk about the railing heights and design? Sure, I can kind of jump off here. Like, so we did, a, you know, we did extensive discussion and, and review on, on how to design on both bridges in regard to the edges. Uh, the guardrail along the timber bridges is inboard of the actual timber. Um, and so we're creating a, a natural offset. Uh, from the edge uh, and the timber structure is a good, you know, 18 to 24 inches overall width in construction and the path itself kind of floats within that. So there's a natural kind of distance between the edge of the, the guardrail and, and the structure itself. And in addition to that, the guardrail itself is, is not just your regular guardrail uh, from a code perspective, but actually a little bit higher to provide that um, extra uh, kind of protection uh, for people not to be able to climb naturally over it or do some other things. And so the combination of both really allowed us to kind of create a, a clear vision, creating a separation for the pedestrian to the edge, uh, but still, uh, but also maintain a visceral uh, presence to the city uh, and not a, not a cage condition that uh, feels sometimes projects a, a lesser safe environment. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question for Mauricio. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the budget for the project? Sure. Um, the budget for the project is $50 million, which is split three ways between Brookfield Properties, which will be, um, will, which will pay $20 million, uh, ESD or Empire State Development, $20 million as well, and then Friends of the High Line will, will uh, raise $10 million for this bridge. So total $50 million. Thank you. Uh, we have a question about uh, why wood was chosen for the timber bridge. I know you talked about this, but if you had anything else to, to add to the decision to use wood. No, so basically to, to kind of, uh, it's, it was a aesthetic and a carbon efficient uh, decision to, you know, combine the long span needs 
to create an experiential uh, path that was not just utilitarian and do it in a carbon efficient manner. Yeah, I mean, I might just add, I mean, Kim, you and I were actually just talking about this the other day, you know, New York City just is in the process of revising codes, as are many mm -hmm. other cities to actually allow for timber construction up to six stories or so, I believe, um, for buildings. I mean, this is something, it's a, it's a trend that a lot of people are looking at, um, you know, steel also buckles under fire and other things. I mean, there's a lot of um, new uh, technologies, new applications, um, but glue lamb itself has also been around for a very, very long time. There's a lot of strong precedents that show not only its durability, um, but also maintenance and other things. So we definitely did a lot of the research. This was not, um, you know, this is Port Authority, DOT, all of those agencies are reviewing this. So it's gone through a pretty, um, you know, robust set of criteria. Uh, I have two questions about uh, greenery and horticulture. Uh, one is, will there eventually be greenery around the timber bridge? And the second one is, how will you irrigate the plants? And does the Highline use soil moisture probes so that if nature is providing rain, we don't need to irrigate? So we will not, uh, to answer the first question, we will not be providing um, any planting on the Dyer Avenue or Timber Bridge. This is an area that is um, wedged between very tall buildings. So our solar analysis has revealed that it's just not a great environment for, for the growth of plants, as opposed to the um, Woodland Bridge on 30th Street, where it does get sufficient sunlight um, to create a healthy environment. In regards to irrigation, um, the project will be using irrigation, uh, so does the High Line, and it will have um, also soil, soil, uh, soil um, uh, sensors, which basically what they do is they self-regulate the irrigation. The irrigation is a smart system. If we do get a lot of rain, um, the irrigation system will not emit as much water. If we are um, experiencing um, long periods without rain in the summer, the irrigation system will also provide a little bit more water than usual. But another really important thing to note in terms of the design is that the walkway itself is suspended over the soil. The soil um, basically is continuous under the walkway. And the walkway has a series of perforations making it a porous material. So any rainwater that actually falls on the bridge is directed directly to the soil, which also in turn minimizes uh, the use of irrigation and water. Lastly, the entire planting palette is uh, native uh, to, um, to the New York State forests within the climate region of New York City. So in doing so, we're also minimizing the use of water because these are plants that are used to the kind of environment in which we're planting them. Thank you. Uh, we have two questions about the timber bridge. Uh, one, is there a translucent roof on the timber bridge or is it open to the elements? And then two, will the wood change color as it ages? So uh, there's not a roof on it. So it's open to the sky uh, and to the sides. So the air flows through it. So it's really an outdoor city experience, but one has a kind of insular perspectile as one walks through it, just through the perspectile nature of it with enough permeability that one feels connected to the street and the surroundings to feel safe uh, at any time of the day. The second question was the uh, aging. Um, the, the species, uh, if we end up with the Alaskan cedar, which is the, the front runner from that would age over time. So it would start off uh, kind of that kind of very kind of colorful wood color and then age over time and get the silvery uh, look that, that we also see on, on the highland benches or in old houses with shingles. Uh, and so it's really an aging uh, of materiality over time uh, and get a patina. Yeah, and I would just add that that's like a, it's a similar to the weathering steel and the other materials. So we're allowing them to naturally age without having sealants and other sort of, um, you know, things that might have you know, that also require a lot of maintenance and also a lot of times have, um, what's the right word, uh, toxins in them, quite frankly. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, 
Um, I just want to go back to the questions about railings and safety. Can you be um, explicit and specific? What is the height of the barriers on the timber bridge? Isabel, do you want to take this? I know you were just um, doing a lot of work on this particular question. <laughs> sure. So the, the barriers on the timber bridge are 54 inches in height. Uh, this is taller than your regular railing that you see on a balcony, which is usually 42 inches. And the reason we came up uh, with that number is because um, New York State DOT actually uses that as their standard for any pedestrian or bicycle bridge um, that crosses uh, long distances and is over um, you know, very high elevations. So it is a New York State standard that's used for this kind of place. In addition to that, we wanted to make sure that this was not only something that met regulations, but that was also comfortable for almost everybody understanding all of us humans are of different sizes. Um, so to give you an example, I am five feet tall and Kim is somewhere above, above six feet. And what we did to um, come up with this dimension is we actually walked across the high line where we do have um, guardrails of many different heights. And we tried to find guardrails that were um, higher than the regular 42 inches, but that for a person of my size, felt safe while not impeding your eye level because what we didn't want to do is create a guardrail where um, you're looking at the frame instead of the view around you. We also wanted to make sure that for people that were very tall, it didn't feel like a, an element that was perhaps unsafe given that we are over a roadway. So between the balance of what the New York State regulations are and understanding all of our um, sizes as, as different people, we thought that was a really good balance, something that made everybody feel safe while still allowing you to see out. Lastly, and of importance, is that the material of um, the guardrails is a stainless steel mesh, very similar to what you see on the High Line. And these stainless steel mesh meshes are engineered so that you cannot get a foothold on it. Um, it is stiff, it will be safe, but it will not allow you to climb it, which we know is also a very important consideration on a public space over a roadway like this one. Hope that addresses um, the question. Thank you. Um, we have a question. How immersive is the immersive environment on the bridge from the High Line? With the slanting tree line, um, one, does one always get a view onto the city? Without yeah, I mean, view, actually, it, seems the, it might feel unsafe. Sorry, just yeah, I mean, if you can see from this rendering, you know, there's the, the higher end um, towards the spur, you're actually getting the view out, right? So you have the planting, if you're walking towards Moynihan, the planting would be to your left and you'd have the vista to your right. In the middle is actually where the planting is the lowest. So you can kind of, you're, you're within the planting, but you can still see out. And then when you move past that, the planting is more to your right. And so you have the view to the left. And so this experiential quality allows you to kind of both be in the one hand buffered from all of that context, but also allow for vistas out. And I, I think like for those of you, I mean, the Chelsea thicket for those of you that know it is actually like quite tight, you know, in there in terms of how the planting comes up around you, it's almost like a tunnel. Um, and so while some of the species are the same here, you know, we wanted to create both the feeling of being insulated, but also not, you know, claustrophobic. Thank you. Um, we have a question. Um, what about birds nesting on the bridge? Is there a concern about this? Uh, there is a concern and we talked about it and we, we solved it by all the timber elements, uh, upper uh, surfaces are actually not flat. So they all have a, a pitch, I believe about 30%, uh, which is a, a scientifically experimented uh, slope that birds can sit on. Uh, and so it was definitely a critical criteria we wanted to solve uh, in a design solution rather than an after the fact solution. We are encouraging them to go to the trees, though, on the woodland bridge. That is correct. <laughs> Just looking through the questions that come through. 
I think we're we're nearing the end of the questions submitted that are design oriented questions. If anyone else has any additional design questions, this would be the time to submit them. Uh, Mauricio, I have a question uh, for you. Um, who will maintain the plantings? That'll be the Friends of the High Line. And one other question that would be for you as well. Um, uh, maybe too early for this discussion, how would pets access be handled? I'm guessing no pets on the Woodland Bridge. I, I think it it's early. I don't want us, I know the High Line, we have no pets. Um, a policy, so I don't want to say yes or no because I think that's a little too early. But again, similar to the question about um, that I meant answered earlier, we'll take into consider some consideration some of the the actual policies and kind of the way we operate the High Line to to the way we operate the, these two bridges. Um, so more to come on that. All right, thank you so much. And I think that we have reached the end of our Q&A for this presentation. Um, want, um, in the next few uh, coming weeks, we'll publish an FAQ on our website to address commonly raised questions. And then also, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, this uh, presentation has been recorded and the uh, recording will be uploaded to the Highline's website. I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, and thanks especially to the design team, Kim, Lisa, and Isabel uh, for joining us. Um, and uh, we look forward uh, to continuing talking about this project in, in the time to come. And thank you again for 